Sunday. Um, Pentecost, if you have not uh, heard this story, I'm, I'm not going to go through it to, right this minute, but one of the main takeaways is understanding, that people who spoke different languages understood one another. And we're kind of a funny time, right? Like with the new CDC announcement about the guidelines about masks, a lot of things are changing and they've changed fast. And um, some of it's hard for us to understand. Some of us, it's hard for understand why we are making the choices each other are making. Um, but we just want to make sure that you know that you are welcome here. And we want to be understanding with each other. We want to be loving with each other in the decisions that we're making, whether we are or whether we're not wearing a mask. We are trying to be uh, really mindful of what that looks like in community, knowing that all of our young children have not yet had the chance to be vaccinated, right? So over here in this section, we have a masked section. So if you're sitting with your family and you'd like to be around other people that are masked, that's an option for you. Also, the balcony in the sanctuary is available for that. We really also want to celebrate the science and the scientists and the medical community who has brought us to the point that we have, I see your faces for the first time in so long. So let's lift up the joy of that. Let's remember that this is an evolving time, that this is a time where all of our feelings are, are moving and shifting and changing, and we have different risk tolerances. We have different circumstances in our families. Let's be good to one another and kind to one another and caring to one another. So in the spirit of Pentecost, we're going to um, dust off a very wonderful old song, um, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. And uh, we had so much fun practicing this this morning, so I hope you'll have fun singing it with us. Let's all stand up, kind of stretch out, stretch out into the expansiveness that God offers us, a welcome for all. All right, you got to move your body a little bit this morning. You could even clap if you wanted to. It's Pentecost. You can pretend you're Pentecostal. As we gather, kindle our souls. Our broken pieces becoming whole. A new beginning, a brand new day. Bring us together in every way. short God to do what's right guide us swiftly back to the light let peace and justice together reign let all the faithful catch spirits flame
Well, we want to pass the peace of Christ to one another, but understand we're in different places about touching each other all the way. Kind of look in each other's eyes and gauge it. You might want to go with an elbow bump. You might want to be like, peace be with you. Or my favorite, peace be with you. Look at one another. Look at each other's faces. Celebrate this. I can see your cheekbones. It's a beautiful thing. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Show your smiles. I think it's going to be a minute. We're going to have a little bit of awkwardness on how we navigate this. Somebody reached out to shake my hand the other day and then kind of stopped like, uh-oh, did I just get this wrong? And I was kind of mid-arm out. And, I, and we had this moment of looking at each other going, ooh, this is a little awkward. And then we laughed, and then it wasn't awkward anymore. We're moving forward. We are moving forward. Just peace be with you. Peace be with you. All right, we're going to sing a little bit more together. Love that piano in this room. Oh. 
Lord Still be my vision Oh, ruler of all. So as Andrew mentioned, today is Pentecost, which is the day that we celebrate the birthday of the church. Um, and uh, my oldest son's birthday was this past week. And usually on, in the morning when we get them up for school, it's like you got to like basically shake the earth in order to wake them up. But on Tuesday morning, I go upstairs and he's already up. He's dressed. He bounds out of the room. It's like, it's my birthday. <laughs> and that's one of the beautiful things that I think we miss sometimes in church is that giddy childlike energy that comes from the love of God for all of us and for this world. And so I hope as you consider Pentecost and celebrate Pentecost today that the joy and the life that comes from God would fill each and every single one of your hearts and go, and go with you as you go from this place. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for being someone who brings us life and joy and love. And God, we celebrate today the birthday of your church. And we pray that we may live with the fiery imagination of those people who looked out at the world and saw people who needed to be fed, people who needed to be loved, who looked out in the world and didn't see barriers that kept people apart, but broke down every single barrier because the love of God meant that there was no way that we were going to ever stop loving those around us, no matter who they were, no matter where they came from. God, we lift up to you today all of the joys and the hopes, all the heartaches and sadness that this congregation has. And we lift them up knowing that you hear us and that you love us and care about us. And God, we pray that we, as your people, would go and share with one another those joys and that we would be there and comfort one another as we experience those heartaches. God, you are a God who is great and wonderful and beautiful. You are our vision and may we see you everywhere we go. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. When I think of worship, sometimes I think about standing on the edge of a creek bed, inching a little bit closer to the water putting my feet in the edge, feeling the cool on my toes, a little bit of refreshment for my being. So as we sink deeper into worship this morning, draw near and step into what Christ has for you today. Chorus, 
we are joining as we sing. We are praying with heroines and heroes, Moses, Mary, and Romero, yes, and Martin Luther King. There is a prayer like a wide river. It never ends, does not begin. Around the world, it's always flowing. I am stepping in. We are 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 stepping in. It's good to see y'all's faces. I had a conversation with a church member earlier who seemed grateful that I was still wearing my mask. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, I have, a, I have a, you know, I'm vaccinated, don't worry. But I have, a, I have a child at home who has a cough that sounds like she's been smoking unfiltered camels for 60 years. So it's sort of a double, you don't want it, you know. Um, but it is so good to, to be in God's house together and gathered back together um, Clay's been preaching on the family lately and continues that sermon series today. And it's just made me think about families so much over the past month or so and how much we're formed in families. And there's a poem that I love that I've never shared in church because it has a swear word. Um, but if you could share a poem with a swear word, it would be the bridge. But don't worry, I'm going to filter it this morning. But it's by a real cranky poet. He was a real cranky man called Philip Larkin. Not a nice person. We would not have, you would not have wanted to have been around him very long. But he writes some great poems, and this one I love. It's called, This Be the Verse. It goes, they mess you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. <laughs> but they were messed up in their turn by old fools in, by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. So get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> Clearly not a lovely person to be around at a dinner party. The thing I love about that poem, and obviously he's being tongue in cheek, but we are made, we are formed in our families. When I think back on my family, I thank God that I had a mama who taught me to love Scripture and read Scripture and memorize Scripture and write down my prayer requests. And I love and uh, thank God that I had a daddy who I'd get off the school bus sometimes and come home and often see him with the Bible on his lap or to see his eyes still closed in prayer. Those lessons stayed with me so that even when times were difficult between me and God, I had a faith that I knew would hold. Those were gifts that my family gave me. And just as we are formed in our individual families, so too we are formed in the families of church that we gather with. We are formed in Bible study and we are formed in worship. And most importantly, I think, we are formed here at the table, at the center of our faith. We recognize that it's not about words, but it's about hospitality, the table that Christ sets before us, the table that we are all welcome to this morning. And we read in Scripture that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and having given thanks for it, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. I'll now invite our elder, Jeremiah Pyron, up here to bless our communion meal.
Thank you. Let us pray. Thank you, dear God, for this beautiful day, for our church, for our family and friends. Be with those unable to join us today. <clears throat> Be with those who are struggling and heal those who are sick. May this bread and cup not just be merely symbolic and routine, but a time to truly pause and remember God's sacrifice and love for us and reflect on our lives. We are grateful for your never-ending love and forgiveness. As our faults and shortcomings are many, may this observance nourish our faith and strengthen our spirituality. In your name we pray. Amen. friend a stranger one do now belong to him once far away you are brought home into God's family when you do this remember me now my also yours my people are your own embrace together in God's arms I unfold you now in mine when you do this remember me all your sorrow shall be mine your joy shall be my joy indebted to god's love in christ we die and reign with him when you do this remember me renew our faith remembering our Lord to our strong hope we will hold fast unshaken to the end when you do this remember everybody how you doing I'd like to um, go ahead and we're gonna read our scripture this morning so if we could get that put up on the screen um, we have there's two passages one is from the Gospel of Matthew and the second one is uh, from Ephesians so let's begin with Matthew 12 uh, while he was still speaking to the crowds his mother and his brothers were standing outside uh, wanting to speak to him someone told him look your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. But the one who had told him this, Jesus said this. He replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 
Now we turn to uh, Ephesians 6. We've been in Ephesians uh, for the past, well, three, I guess two or three weeks. And this is what Paul writes in the final chapter of Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness, the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. This is the word of God for the people of God, and together we can say, thanks be to God. Join me for a word of prayer. Loving God, as we continue this sermon series called uh, Family Dynamics, I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds, that we can hear a word from you. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to thank our youth for uh, leading worship last week. Um, They did a great job, especially our graduating seniors. We're very proud of you guys. And uh, Woodmont will always be here for you. I want to thank Chris Cox, Jay Simmons, who's down at the 915 service, as well as all of our sponsors that invest time and energy and emotion uh, into our youth program. Thank you guys for what you do and uh, for what you did last week. Megan and I took a very short uh, trip for our anniversary and I watched the youth on live stream. So it's nice that we have live stream of this service and the the later service. Um, But you know, we took a short trip, which I think is healthy for couples to do. and, and, And on the one hand, it seems like 12 years was like, it's like, it seems like a long time. But on the other hand, 12 years goes by really, really fast. And so we spent some time on this trip um, just kind of reminiscing and looking back uh, over uh, over our our marriage and and just kind of saying, what's changed? What's happened? Well, we've we've had three kids. That's different. Uh, We've moved houses. We've watched the church grow and change and evolve over that time. We've uh, we've lost some friends, uh, close friends to cancer. We've become... Uh, close to some people, new people over the years, and, um, and, and we've had to say goodbye to some people. Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Do you remember that? And so I think that it's healthy for all of us, for couples, for individuals, for families, to, to just take stock of our lives and say, you know, how are we doing? What's happened to us? What's changed? What's grown? What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? Um, I think that that's, a, uh, that that's a healthy thing. We've been in this sermon series called Family Dynamics, and we've been looking at Ephesians, and the reality is, you know, every family is different. Every marriage is, is different. But we, we've been talking about how can we make family a priority? How can we make sure that we are investing time and energy and emotion into the relationships that we say are the most important? Because truth be told, sometimes we just give our family and our spouse what's left over. We give them the crumbs. We, 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 get, we don't have anything left at the end of the day, and that's not right, and that's not fair. One of the reasons we did this series is because, in case you haven't noticed, the last 14 months have been really hard, really, really hard on everybody, but especially on, on couples and, and young families. And so we're talking about some basic biblical principles that we can apply to our marriages and to our families, and many of these are, are found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now, you might remember that back in 1989, there was a book that became a bestseller blockbuster book written by Stephen Covey 
that was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in case you're not familiar with that book, let me summarize it really quick. He gave seven uh, habits uh, of highly effective people. This is what they do on a regular basis. First, he said, be proactive. Take initiative. Second, he said, begin with the end in mind. Third, he said, put first things first. You know, live out your, uh, live out your priorities. Uh, I think this list looks a little uh, messed up. There's only six. Fourth, he said, think win-win. Fifth, he said, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Sixth was synergize. Never, you know, use teamwork, uh, complementary skills. And then the seventh thing that Covey said was sharpen the saw. Never stop learning, never stop growing, never stop uh, uh, trying to get better, get sharper, learn more in life. So a couple years ago, at the 30th anniversary of this book, I decided to sit down and I said, you know, what would it be like if we were to come up with seven habits of highly spiritual people? What would that be? And so these are, these are mine. I didn't get these from anybody. Uh, so, so this is what I came up with. I said the first habit would be be disciplined. Carve out time in your life for prayer, for Bible study, for worship, you know, for a small group. Disconnect from all the noise and disruptions of the world. Second was keep the big picture in mind. Human beings sometimes can get so worked up over little things that don't really matter in the big picture. We can major in the minors, and I think that's a problem. The third thing was live out your priorities. Uh, good is the enemy of great. Don't let the small stuff rule the day. Know what matters most and choose to focus on that first. If you don't get to the other things that are less important, then so be it. That's okay. Fourth, treat others the way you want to be treated. Remember, Jesus gave us the golden rule in the Sermon on the Mount. Some people would be amazed to be on the receiving end of their words and actions. So think about how you're treating other people, how you're coming across. Fifth, show empathy and compassion. Everybody's fighting a battle of some sort, so be kind, be empathetic. Sixth, form meaningful relationships with people who make you better. Surround yourself with people that are going to challenge you to grow, that are going to challenge you to do better, to be better, uh, uh, that, that are not just going to pull you down. And, and then seventh, the seventh spiritual habit was avoid getting angry whenever possible or at least find healthy ways to deal with your anger. And I think that anger, resentment, bitterness, all of those things in life can take us away from our spiritual center. Now in Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, that I read just a little bit ago, somebody comes up to Jesus while he's speaking to the crowds and says, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. But Jesus replies to them with a question. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he points over to his 12 disciples and he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You see, Jesus was always talking and teaching about the kingdom of God. And for Jesus, family is not just tied to blood, but to people who work to bring the kingdom of God on earth, on earth as it is in heaven, is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. So when we talk about church family or our faith family, I think that all the principles that I'm going to share with you this morning, all the habits that I'm going to share, I think they apply to our church family. It applies to our family of faith. Some people don't have blood family, and so they look at the church as their family. And guess what? This is your family, and we are here for you. And these same principles apply. So as I kind of close out uh, this series on family dynamics, Donovan's going to bring the message next weekend. So buckle your seatbelt. Um, I just want to share with you what I've come up with as the seven habits of highly uh, spiritually healthy families. And, and there's nothing perfect about this list. You might have some others that you would add on there. But I'm going to base every one of these on some of these verses from Ephesians that we've been looking at. So, so these are the seven habits uh, of spiritually healthy families. Habit number one. Spiritually healthy families apply their faith in God to every single aspect of their lives. Not just at church, not just on Sunday, but all the time. You know, Paul says this in Ephesians 4. He says, I beg you, 
to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what Paul writes. So from these verses, we can figure out what's important in family life. Humility, gentleness, patience, love, peace. These are the things that spiritually healthy families learn to prioritize. So many people think that the faith is just what you do on Sunday, and then you just go about your life. But that's not true. Faith is not just what you do on Sunday. Faith is what you do every single day. It, it should inform your words, your actions, and all of your relationships. It doesn't mean that you have to talk about it all the time, but I would say that some families need to learn to talk about it at least a little bit. It does mean that faith must be lived out every single day. The second habit of spiritually healthy families is that they value peace. You know, families that are fighting all the time, families where there is tension all the time, that's not a family that values peace. Paul says, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And guess what? Peace is something that we have to work for. It's something that we have to plan for. Families that are always arguing and blaming each other don't get to experience peace. And I think spiritual families should do everything that they can to create and maintain peace. It doesn't mean that life is perfect. It just means that we, we try to limit the drama and the pettiness whenever we can. I think that something that's related to this concept of peace, and I'm not saying the stewardship campaign is over, by the way, uh, but this is important. Part of finding peace in your family is finding financial peace. Learning to live within your budget. It's been said before that people buy things they can't afford with money they don't have to impress people they don't really care about. You ever heard that? Learning to find financial peace and learning to live within your means is, is, is very, very important. Um, as a church family, we're doing that. We're setting our budget for the next year, trying to be responsible. Another thing that I was thinking about this week is a way that we can work for peace is, is what it has to do with this mask stuff. Um, the CDC said if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. There's other folks that, that feel much more comfortable wearing a mask, and that's okay. We need to cut each other some slack on this mask stuff a little bit because everybody's doing the best they can after 15 months. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. So when we truly follow Christ, we experience peace in our families, and peace matters. Third habit, spiritually healthy families value the truth, and they tell the truth. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbor, for we are members of one another. Families that keep secrets from each other where some people are in the know and other people aren't always run into trouble because sooner or later somebody figures out that they are not in the loop or even worse, that they were lied to and then trust starts to erode. People say, well, 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 you didn't tell me that. What else are you not telling me? So spiritually healthy families tell the truth to each other even if and when the truth hurts. Truth is essential for trust, and it's essential for healthy family dynamics. We live in an age where many people cannot agree on the truth. But families should not lie to each other. They should tell the truth to each other because when they don't, problems arise and people get hurt and hurt very deeply. Fourth habit, spiritually healthy families do everything in their power, everything in their power to not act out in anger. Paul writes, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. You see, anger usually happens in families when somebody is disappointed, when somebody feels let down. When, when somebody feels hurt or betrayed. But when family members get angry and they, they say and they do things that they can't take back, the toothpaste is out of the bottle. So we need to heed Paul's advice and not act out in our anger. Be angry, but do not sin. 
Paul is acknowledging that we will experience anger. And we all get angry for, for various reasons. Some family members are more likely to get angry than others. But anger can do a lot of damage in marriages, relationships between uh, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. Um, it can be very unhealthy. And so we have to find healthy outlets for expressing our anger. Fifth habit. I usually give you guys like three or four, so I hope you're still with me here. Okay, fifth habit this morning. Spiritually healthy families encourage each other and they build each other up. Paul says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. It's so easy in life to tear down and to criticize, to point out everything that's wrong. You know how easy that is? It's much more difficult to compliment and to build up and to be positive. Family needs to be a place where we are encouraged and where we build up. Every member of the family needs to be careful with their words because words have power. Words have meaning. Words can do a lot of damage or a lot of good. The Bible talks about the power of the tongue and how you can do amazing things with it and you can do some really destructive things with it. And so I think that families need to do everything they can to build each other up, to compliment each other often, because constant criticism from the people that we love the most really starts to wear on us after a while, you know? That's not healthy. That's not good. Sixth habit. Spiritually healthy families learn to forgive and then let things go. Paul continues in that passage. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 4. When bad things happen in families and somebody is deeply hurt for whatever reason, we usually have a choice to make. We can address the hurt and then choose to forgive or we can stuff the hurt away and then over time, it turns into resentment, and then over time, it turns into contempt. And like I said a couple of weeks ago while I was talking about marriage, once you have contempt in your marriage or in your relationship, it becomes toxic very, very quickly. That's what the therapists say. That's what the psychologists say, not just, not just the preacher. And so what we have to do is get to a place where we can forgive each other and then let things go. And so maybe we need to learn to say things like, I'm sorry, I screwed up. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Because we carry these burdens through life in our families, and if we just address them and dealt with them and unpack them, then our load would be so much lighter for so many years. Learn to forgive and then let it go. I, I think forgiveness is a recipe for survival, and yet so many people say, I believe in forgiveness, but they don't practice it. Lastly this morning, the seventh habit of spiritually healthy families is that they worship and they pray together. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power. He says, pray in the spirit at all times. You see, Paul understood the power of prayer. He understood that so many of the habits that I've mentioned this morning can be accomplished and can happen through the power of prayer. And it's not just obligatory prayer before dinner. It's praying and communicating with God at all different times. It's being open to what God is doing and how God is moving in your life. And guess what? It's not just talking. Part of praying is listening. Because if you're always talking, you may not hear what God is trying to say to you. Here are the seven habits. Jesus prayed all the time, and through prayer, we find the strength to deal with the stresses and the challenges that life throws our way. And I've always said that it doesn't matter what you say when you pray or where you pray or how you pray. What matters is that you pray, and when you pray, you expect things to happen. Number one, spiritually healthy families apply their faith to every aspect of their lives. Number two, they work for peace. They value peace. Number three, they tell the truth. Number four, they learn to manage anger and not act out in anger. Number five, they encourage and build each other up. Number six, they learn to forgive and let things go. And then number seven, spiritually healthy families worship and pray together. 
I believe that if we can incorporate these habits into our marriages and into our family life, then life will be more balanced, life will be less stressful, more fulfilling, and frankly, I think it'll be much more enjoyable. Would you join me in prayer? Loving God, I'm so thankful for all the families represented in this room, whether it's one person or eight people. I pray that we can all think about how we can learn from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, how we can apply these principles uh, to our marriages, to our families, to the people that we love the most. Um, family life is not easy. Uh, family life has been very stressful during this pandemic, but family life is absolutely necessary because our world needs families that love and care for each other, and that also includes the church family. So be with us and help us to apply these principles. Give us the strength and the guidance to do that. In Christ's name, amen. My family is a family of two, two people here in Nashville. We got some, uh, my dad and um, his new wife, who he, we watched them get married on Zoom during the pandemic. That was, whoa. And, um, and then my sister and her husband have three little kids. Um, but my family is me and my little girl. And, um, and families can look so many different ways. And all of those habits that Clay just discussed, those can overlay in any context of family. You might notice the gorgeous flowers that we have here in this room today, and those are from a new expression of family that has risen out of our midst, which is that Brian Sargent and Laura Hobson were married yesterday right here, which we were so excited for them. And um, just an absolute, uh, just what beautiful, wonderful people, and Clay and I got to be here. Most, most of the wedding was live streamed, and so maybe you got to see it. Um, but we were just so delighted to celebrate that as the first wedding here in this chapel, beautiful in every way. And they're on their honeymoon now. Now, I have to tell you, there were seven of us that were part of the ceremony, Brian's daughter and her partner. And um, anyway, so we had a couple of chairs up on the, up on the stage here, and at the end of the wedding you know they had taken some photos and everything and then here comes Brian and he starts stacking the chairs <laughs> so you knew that he he was really actually having a bridge moment Brian Sargent has faithfully stacked chairs at the bridge for 11 years so I said knock it off man you don't need to stack chairs on your wedding day what an example of a servant's heart I want us to celebrate Brian and Laura, but also all of the ways that this congregation shows up as servants to one another. We show up with our time, with our financial resources, with our gifts. If you look around the walls of this church, there, are, there is art that is made by people within the congregation. Um, Robin Hine is an interior designer. She did a whole bunch of interior design with this new space. Jamie Hewling, a woodworker, building things, literally building things for the use of the congregation in worship. The music directors, the Sunday school teachers, so many different ways that we serve and work together. The garden of prayer is tended by volunteers in the congregation. What is God calling you to bring and to share? Maybe that's writing a check or making your um, offering contribution online, making a pledge. Maybe it's volunteering for Sunday school or to be part of one of the creative teams. When we give generously from our hearts, 
God expands our hearts. And, and what we give often comes back to us from our brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ. So the deacons have baskets that you can put your um, offering in as you leave. We're, we're still not quite passing uh, baskets here in this service, but, um, but you can do that, or also you can do bank draft or um, automatic transfer online on the website. Think about what God is calling for you to share at this time in your life as we sing this next song. If you want me to leave, if you want me to follow, I, I will. If you want me to grow, or if you want me to stay here, I, I. bloom where you plant me I, I will if I should let go or if you want me to hold on for giving us an object lesson on how to serve one another in love. Thank you, Matt, for fixing my guitar. <laughs> really, in all seriousness, that really was a wonderful moment. Just to, you know, we, we, we think about serving each other. Um, it feels kind of abstract. You know, I think about it like when someone sets a plate of pancakes in front of me, serving me, okay, right? But, but really what serving each other means is recognizing a need and saying, how can I help? And if the person's like, yeah, cool, help, please. That's awesome. And, and to be able to do that just with a little look of panic in the eyes, pretty nice. <laughs> um, really and truly, this is kind of the unsung heroes of all live entertainment, music, drama, everything, is, is the technical crew that makes everything work. So let's take a second to thank Matt and Rachel and Steven and Gehrig who have so many new buttons to push in this space and have done it all with grace and, and really take such good care of our congregation. 
Um, I really appreciate you all so much. And you may not realize, but Rachel Moser is formerly Rachel All. Well, you're still Rachel All, but um, she has na changed her name because she and Matt got married, and Rachel was the very first sound engineer the bridge ever had 11 years ago. She's back with us today um, taking a break from, um, from pro touring just for the weekend, so we're so delighted to have her. Thank you all. All right, so our final song this morning actually comes from, it's, it's, it's a cool scripture because it's found in two places in the Bible. One of them, it attacks on with the Ephesian scripture that Clay shared for, as part of his message, but also comes um, from the book of Isaiah. And it was written by our own Tom Schuyler, who is Toulouse Dad. So if you, uh, if you recognize this song, we're going to do it with a bridge twist. So <laughs> but we want to be thinking and lifting up to Lou and her family, all of the Skylers and all the Quins and everybody who loves her. All right, let's stand up and share this last song together. Here we go. This week, remembering to serve God with gladness and let the joy of the Lord dwell among you. Go in peace to serve God and to serve one another. Amen. Yeah. 